Good evening, this is Jack Cummings with uh, Doorway Hope Ministries, and uh, I told you guys uh, a while back that there would probably be times that I would want to post a sermon that uh, was not part of the lessons that I was doing, and um, tonight's the night. Um, this was a sermon that I preached back in uh, March, on March 14th at, at Doorway Hope, and uh, I've been meaning on on uploading that sermon, and I uh, just never did seem to get around to it. And uh, I wanted to do an upload tonight. I wanted to do something tonight, and um, I just uh, did not think I'd be able to to do a teaching tonight. It's been ready for every week, but I uh, just didn't think I'd be able to do it. And uh, so I want to go ahead and upload this sermon. And see how that works. And uh, I, I trust that uh, you will get something out of this sermon. And uh, I'll come back at the end. Now, this is uh, filmed at our church on a phone. And so uh, we're zooming in a little bit, trying to clean it up a little bit. So it may not be the best quality. But uh, hopefully um, hopefully it will do fine. You can hear it. If uh, if you're not not real happy with how it looks, you can just listen at it. But uh, I pray that you'll get something out of it. So uh, God bless you again for stopping by. And uh, uh, thank you much. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get into this. So. Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God for what you're doing in this nation. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in this people, Lord God. I thank you for what you're doing in your church. I thank you for what you're doing uh, in here today, Father God. I thank you. I thank you for your word. <clears throat> I thank you, Lord God, for your presence. I thank you, Lord God, for your plans, Father God. We praise you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord God. I've been looking forward to this sermon, uh, and uh, I've been looking so forward to it that uh, I actually had to not only have my notes, but I made an outline so that I wouldn't just blow apart when I was going through it. So uh, hopefully I won't keep you past your dinner time, but, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll feed you some spiritual food. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm excited about the message, and I hope you get something out of it. I promise you that you'll hear some things you haven't heard. I promise you that you'll probably be stirred up. I hope you are. I hope you are stirred up before we get out of here. So, all right. So one of the first things that I want to start talking about today, and we know this, and we've studied the Word of God, we know that, that this is true, that God is a God of patterns. I don't know that he has to be a God of patterns, but he is a God of patterns. He does things with a particular pattern. Now, I think it's interesting that the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion, and so knowing that God is not the author of confusion may explain to us why God works in patterns. And, uh, you know, like I've, I've told you before, God is constantly trying to reveal himself to us. And him trying to reveal us, himself to us, he works with patterns. We can see patterns in family. We can see patterns in the tabernacle. We see patterns in all kinds of different things. Uh, some of the patterns, I'm walking around with the outline. Some of the patterns that I want to look at, uh, just real quick, to uh, show you that God is a God of patterns. We should know that. Uh, one of them is the number six. You know, uh, God created man on the sixth day. Six is the number of man. When you start talking about uh, different things with the number six, you know, we talk about the Antichrist, and his number would be 666. What's 666? That's a man trying to be triune God. He's trying to be a three-part God. That's 666. When you start uh, studying the Word of God, and you'll not find this in any of the new translations because they translate it a different way. They translate it, instead of translating it into cubits, they translate it into feet or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. But you may lose some of the symbolism, but, you know, when you get over and you start reading about Goliath, Goliath had the number six all over him. He was six cubits tall. He slept in a bed that was six cubits long. I think that's right. Uh, his, his staff was six cubits. Everything about him was six cubits. He had six cubits, six fingers on his hand, six fingers on his toe. The number six, number man, is all over that guy. And so, you know, if you, had, if you said, well, he's nine feet tall, you kind of lose that, don't you? But you say, he was six cubits tall. Oh, there's the number six. There he is right there. Uh, seven is a number of completeness. Anytime that you read the Bible and you come across the number seven, you know that that is complete. God rested on the seventh day. That's the number of completeness. 
That's why seven days in a week, because after seven days, it's complete. And I heard George Meyer say something the other day. You guys know I like to throw out little nuggets, you know, if it doesn't, even if it doesn't have anything to do with anything um, that we're studying. But one of the little nuggets that I heard George Meyer say the other day was that Adam's first full day, now Adam was created on the sixth day, the seventh day, God rested. So Adam's first full day was just hanging out with God, just hanging out. You know, just sitting with God and talking to God. You know, man, I mean, that's where we're supposed to be. Aren't we supposed to enter that rest? Amen. Aren't we supposed to labor to enter rest? Mm -hmm. And so that was what Adam did. That's what we're supposed to be doing is resting mm -hmm. and cooperating with God and knowing what he wants. But you'll find that when you do what God wants you to do, there's a rest in it. Mm -hmm. Eight, what is the number of eight? Vicky knows. What's the number eight? New beginnings. New beginnings. New beginnings. Anytime you see the number eight, you got new beginnings. What was Monday... Or, yeah, what was Monday after the Sabbath? After the day of rest, what was Monday? A brand new week. Mm -hmm. So Monday is number eight. Uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, no. Monday's no. That's wrong. Uh, the, seventh, the Sabbath day was on a Saturday. Anyway, eight's the number of new beginnings. How many people was on the ark? Eight. Eight. Why? Because that's how many he needed for new beginnings. So God is a God of new beginnings. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Uh, nine, nine, nine is an interesting number. How many, does anybody know how, many, how long it took to build a tabernacle in the wilderness? Nine months. What's the big deal about nine months? How long was you in the womb? Nine months. You know, how long was Jesus in the womb? Nine months. Well, how long did it take God to build a tabernacle for him to dwell in? Nine months. So we see that. Uh, that's how long a child is in the womb. How, what's the number of, of testing? Number of testing is 40. You start, you, you go to get on Google, or duck, duck, go. We're trying to get away from the, the big guys that are trying to control information. If you get on duck, duck, go, and you look up the number 40, you'll find a big old long list of the number 40. 40 is the number of testing. Here's a few things that we know about the number 40. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights when Noah was on the ark. Uh, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights when he was out in the wilderness. Why? He was being tested. The Bible even says that he was took out in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He went out there to be tested. Moses was on the mountain away from the children of Israel 40 days and 40 nights. Now Moses was all raptured up in glory, but the, but the children of Israel, guess when they panicked? On the 40th day, man, they said, we don't know what happened to this Moses guy. Throw some gold in the, in the fire and whatever comes out, we'll worship that and call that God. And so that's what they did. And that obviously, oh, it's a cow. Obviously, they didn't just throw it in there and pull it out, but that's what Aaron said. Oh, yeah, man, we just we pulled it in. That's what it looked like. So that's our God. Uh, Israel was in the wilderness how many years? 40 years. When they beat somebody, they beat somebody, the Romans beat somebody, how long? 40 lashes. And they were usually, uh, they would beat you 39 lashes because they're afraid if they beat you 40 lashes, they'd kill you. And so they was afraid they miscount somewhere. Uh, I could have probably told them how many times they'd, they'd hit me. But uh, anyway, they did that. Goliath, when Goliath came out to fight against the children of Israel, you know how long he presented himself before David did something? 40 days. So is there a pattern there? Yeah, man, there's a pattern there. So when we study, also when we study the Bible, we can find shadows and types. Uh, Joseph, we talked about uh, Joseph last week. Olivia uh, taught a good lesson on Joseph. And when we look at that, he was a type of Christ. We know that, that uh, Joseph was betrayed. He was sent into prison. He was uh, uh, lifted up to the right hand of, of uh, Pharaoh. He became the second in command. What did Jesus do? Jesus was betrayed by his brothers. He went into the pit. He rose up, and now he's seated right here to God the Father. We see a pattern there. Uh, sacrifices. When you start studying the sacrifices, you can see all these different sacrifices pointed to Jesus Christ. So we see patterns of shadows and types there. Uh, there's a red band that you can study that runs through Scripture. Remember Rahab the harlot? Hung a red band outside, or they said, if you put a red band outside your window, we'll know not to kill you and your people. What was that all about? Red band, man. The blood of Jesus. That's what that represents. You can study that all through Scripture. The blood that was applied to the doorpost. Red. It was on the doorpost. What that represents. Same thing. It just runs all through Scripture. When we studied about the tabernacle, we studied about all the different uh, utensils in the tabernacle. We studied about all the different furniture in the tabernacle. And we know that each one of these things has a meaning. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Nobody can do anything except through me. You know, you, you're dependent on me. By yourself, you can do nothing. When this thing was in the tabernacle and they filled up the oil, they put the oil in the middle one. And the middle one filled up all of them. Where do we get our anointing from? Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ got the anointing from the Father. I just I shared that uh, on video there yesterday when when uh, uh, Jesus the Bible tells us that when Jesus fulfilled his mission and he went to heaven in the, in the second chapter of Acts, Peter's talking about it when he went to heaven because he did what he was supposed to do. God gave him the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you've got a sinless man. So God gave him the gift of the Holy Spirit back in the book of Genesis. What's it say? God said, my spirit's not always going to fool with him. My spirit is not always going to strive with man because he is indeed sinful. He thinks about stuff, violence and sin all the time. <clears throat> so uh, we see that. We know that that represents Jesus Christ. We know that the branches represent us. It's a pattern. Amen? Amen. So God does things according to pattern. All right, so now there's another pattern that I want to look at. And uh, again, y'all can take notes. Y'all can try to follow me, whatever. Uh, you know, I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures. And uh, like I said, you can jot them down, whatever. In Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And what are you talking about? He's talking about that before Jesus Christ came the first time, that he would send forth a voice in the wilderness. He would send forth somebody in the spirit of Elijah to preach the gospel, to proclaim that, that, that Jesus was coming, that the kingdom of God was going to be manifest. Now, if God is a God of patterns, is God going to do that again? Yes. Yeah, man. We believe, <clears throat> we absolutely believe that God is going to do that again. If, he, if God is a God of patterns and he did it the first time, he's surely going to do it again. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And it's funny that the voice, that term, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, is in all four Gospels. A lot of times when you start looking at the harmony of the Gospels, you'll find Matthew, Mark, and Luke line up a lot. And John talking about something, I mean, when I say he's talking about something totally different, what I mean is he's talking about stuff that they didn't talk about. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they line up. But in each one of the epistles, in each one of the Gospels, that is mentioned uh, <coughs> in the... Uh, in Malachi uh, 4, 5, and 6, God said, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. <clears throat> you know, here in the morning, anytime I get to talking, I guess winter, uh, <clears throat> I'll be glad when that's gone. Anyway, so in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now in Matthew 17, uh, the disciples were talking to Jesus, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then shall it say the scribes that Elijah, Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come and restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. Okay? So we know that God was, Jesus Christ was talking about John the Baptist when he talked about the spirit of Elijah coming. Talked about one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord. He was talking about John the Baptist. Now when Jesus comes again, so what, what did John do? He said, make straight the path of the Lord. Correct? That's what he said John the Baptist's job was going to be. He would come in the spirit of Elijah, and he would make straight the path of the Lord. Okay, so if that's going to happen again, if before Jesus comes back, he's going to make straight the path of the Lord, how is he going to do that? What's going to happen? He's going to send forth a voice crying in the wilderness. In Ephesians 5, 25, 26 and 27, it says, Husbands... Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify, what's he going to do? He's going to sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. We're going to get a lot of word here before too long. We're going to hear a lot of word. And it says, then he might present it to himself a glorious church that's all wrinkled up and dirty and filthy and god off. Is that what he's coming after? No. 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 What's it say? He's going to present himself a glorious church, not having spot or 
wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So Jesus Christ, and, and do not think because of the teaching that we've been doing about historicism and how all, all you know how a lot of revelations already been fulfilled and stuff, that we don't believe Jesus is coming back. What chapter was that? That is Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 25, 26, and 27. So, for Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or blemish. Yes. How's that going to be accomplished? Because I'm telling you, right now, the church of Jesus Christ looks like a great whore. We, we say anything goes, you just live however you want, as long as we can get your money, and you guys know I don't care nothing about money. I'm talking about the, the mainline, streamlined churches. They're, mm, mm. Anyway. Well, what's a whore do? Does things for money. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did not know that I was born here. I am <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I tell you, when the church tells you that anything goes, you do whatever you want, and everything's all right, there's a problem. Yep. The Bible tells us that they would set up teachers that would tickle their ears, mm -hmm. okay? And we're there. They're telling you, you know, if you're a lesbian, that's fine. I, I know churches that they say abortions are good. I know Christians, people who absolutely would stand here and argue. That they say, I am a Christian. I'm going to heaven, Jesus Christ. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they say abortion's okay. There's a lot of churches around that say abortion is okay. I, no, it ain't. I'm sorry. Abortion is not okay. In the Old Testament, the Bible even tells us that if two men got in an argument and started fighting, Say there's a pregnant woman standing here and me and this guy's fighting and we accidentally hit her and she miscarried, they'll kill me. Yeah. I mean, that's straight out of Scripture. God said, kill them. You know why? You took a life. Not a, not a glob. You didn't take a glob of junk. You took a life. That's what God said you took a life. So Jesus ain't coming back for what's here now. I'm telling you, he's not coming back for what we got. He wants this thing cleaned up. He wants this thing straightened up. How's he going to get it cleaned up? How's he going to get it straightened up? Spirit of Elijah. Yeah, yeah. And I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that we're there. I really hope that we're there because it is coming. And whether it comes now or 200 years from now, it is coming. We see the pattern in Scripture. We know that he's coming back for a glorious church. We know that he's going to get the things straightened up before he comes back to rule and reign. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to rule and reign. He's not coming in here to yank us out of here. Oh, here's my, my filthy, horrible-looking bride. Let me yank her out of here and take her to heaven while this thing collapsed. No. Jesus. The church is going to get cleaned up. The church is going to rise up. The church is going to get straightened up. And then Jesus is coming back. According to the way I read my Bible. So how's that going to happen? That's going to happen by him raising up the, uh, a spirit of Elijah. And like I said, I hope, I hope, I hope we're there. I hope we're there. You know, one of the, one of the things you may not remember, you know, the Jews hold on to that so much. Now, of course, they don't think Jesus is coming yet. But you might remember during the cedar, when we had the cedar, that there's, a, there's an area during the cedar. All through the cedar, you set a place for Elijah. Why? Because Elijah's got to come first. Yeah. Elijah's coming first. So all through the cedar, you got this you got this chair sitting there, nobody in it, and you got a plate sitting there, nobody in it, nobody eating at it, and that's the plate of Elijah. That's the seed of Elijah. And so then about midway through the cedar, you go over and you open the door and you wait for the spirit of Elijah to come in. Why? Because Elijah must come first. And Vicki remembers, she, when we had our cedar, mm -hmm. if that's right, cedar, cedar, we, cedar, when we had it, she said, when we opened that door up, man, she said something, just boom. There was just power. There's energy, but boom. Yes. Spirit of Elijah. There is a spirit of Elijah. So now here's the question. You know, so much, so much of what we expect, so many of the things that we talk about, we say, oh, this is going to happen. A great transformation revival. What's that look like? And I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not being mean or anything like. But you know, we talk about a great transformation revival. Well, what is that going to look like? Do we have any idea what that's going to look like? When God raises up the spirit of Elijah, what's that going to look like? Do we have any idea what that's going to look like? Or we just say it's coming. It's going to be great. Is it? I mean, what do you expect? Well, there's.
here's a way to find out what to expect. <clears throat> the way to find out what to expect is this God that's a God of patterns has possibly shown us in his word. And so I got to thinking about that. I said, well, okay, if the spirit of Elijah is coming, thank you, God. I'm, I'm really, I, I hope this goes off as well as it's up here because I love it. I love this sermon. So what can we expect? What, what's it going to look like? So I said, God, you know, I, need, I want to know. So he got me start meditating on John. You got two of them. You got John the Baptist. He was a spirit of Elijah. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. And you got Elijah. How's these guys similar? How are they different? You know, what's going on? What, what are we going to see when the spirit of Elijah rises up? And like I said, I, I am not. You know, when you start listening to a bunch of prophets now, because God is a God of pattern. They will look back and say, well, now, I was reading in my Bible the other day in, in uh, Ezekiel 14, 12, and this happened. This is a pattern. This is one of God's patterns. We're in the same example, same situation right now. So I believe this is going to happen. I don't know what Ezekiel 14, 12 is. It's just something I pulled out of here. But so when you start looking at, at you know, patterns in the Old Testament, God is a God of pattern. It may very well mean this is what's coming. And I, again, this is coming. I do not know when. But this is coming. This is a pattern. So one of the first things to look at about Elijah, when you look at Elijah, Elijah appears suddenly. All of a sudden, people, a voice crying in the wilderness is going to rise up. All of a sudden, you're going to have people <clears throat> rising up and saying this or the other. Uh, the way that the first mention of Elijah is in 1 Kings 17 1. We see that Ahab was an evil king, and Ahab was ruling things, running things in the ground, running things in the ground, and it says, and Elijah the Tishwite, no, no introduction. We don't know, we don't know nothing about his mommy, we don't know nothing about his daddy, we don't know nothing about the guy at all, other than all of a sudden, when he was needed, God rose him up. That's the kind of God that God is. When there is a need, God meets that need. And so it says, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, so we know he came from Gilead, said unto Ahab, the very first time that we see uh, Elijah, he's saying something. Okay? So this, this spirit of Elijah that is going to rise up has got stuff to say. It's got something to say. And he said, uh, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So we know that he came as a Tishbite. Oh, I, mean, I, I, I told you I was trying to, try, I got two different sets of notes. He, so Elijah appeared suddenly. And in looking at what this, uh, I don't, let's just call it wilderness voice. If you want to do that, I'll just say, you tell you, the spirit, one crying, in, the spirit, how about one? The spirit of one, we'll call it that, when the spirit of one rises up, uh, one of the things that I want to share now, when we talk about what is this going to look like, I am sick to death of the world telling me what the church is supposed to look like. Because we have allowed the world to tell us what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to uh, accept. And what we're supposed to pat on the back. And what we're supposed to, all these different things. I'm tired, I'm sick to death of that. Everybody says, oh, well, you know, we just need to love them. Oh, it's okay. It's all right. It's no big deal. You're fine. Uh, God loves you. Everything's wonderful. You guys know that I preach God loves you harder than anybody. God is crazy about you. God loves you. But you're going to have to get your life straightened up. You're going to have to. Jesus didn't come to die for your sins so you could stay in them. When, when Jesus Christ healed people, he said, go and sin no more. Yeah. He didn't say, don't worry about it, everything's fine. He said, go and sin no more. The world tells me that I'm not supposed to come against nothing. I'm not supposed to sin. Jesus said, we are the salt, the salt of the earth. And he said, if the salt loses its flavor, what's it good for? Nothing. You know, when you're driving down the road in the winter, and these people are going in front of you throwing salt, that salt's worth nothing other than that, what it's doing right there. It's not, it, it's lost its flavor. The church has lost its flavor. There's no flavor in the church anymore. In fact, if people, what does salt do? You get salt in oil, what's it going to do? It burns. It purifies, but it burns. You get salt on your food and you taste it, you can taste it. We're scattered throughout the, uh, America, we're scattered throughout the world, we're rubbing elbows with people, and there's no taste to us at all. There's no flavor to us at all. Everything 
things somebody does, we say, that's all right, man. Everything's great. Jesus said, if you put a, put a light, you don't take a light and put it under a bushel basket. You put it on a hill so everybody can see it. We are the light of the world. We are that light. And telling people that what they're doing is going to send them to hell, how is that wrong? I mean, the, if you believe it, how's that wrong? God loves you. God died for you. He doesn't want you to die and get to hell. You know what? What that? I wish we had one here. But you know what? Gee, I was thinking about it. You know what that is when Jesus said you put a light and you don't put a basket over it. Yeah, you got a you got a light in your house. You got a dimmer on it. Anybody got a dimmer? That's what Jesus is talking about. You know. Now, do we want our light to shine, or do we want to put a dimmer? Well, that's what we do. We put a little dimmer switch on our light. So well, I'm going out in the world. Let's turn this thing way down. Let's see how dark. Ugh, let's see how dark we can get this light and still see. So the the spirit of Elijah will appear suddenly. That's what Elijah did. He appeared suddenly. Did John the Baptist appear suddenly? We know about his history. You know, we know that that. Uh, Zacchaeus was his dad and who his mom was and that whole story. But in a way, John did appear suddenly. Well, when I say that, I mean that they just come out of nowhere. There's going to be voices when this starts. I wish I, I wish I, next Tuesday at 4.30. I don't know when it's going to start. We may be gone, Megan, you may be an old lady. And all of a sudden he said, well, Jack Cummings told me about that years ago. I don't know when it's going to start. I just know that it's going to start. But all of a sudden, you're going to hear about people you never heard tell of. And they're going to have a message. And they're going to be known. People's going to know about them. People's going to <clears throat> talk about them. <clears throat> they're going to <clears throat> rise up out of nowhere. So John, even though uh, we know where he came from and everything, all of a sudden, because it says, uh, where's that scripture? In those days, there was a very specific time that all of a sudden, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Okay. Now, here's something you can get excited about, if you're, if you're not excited already. Elijah, the spirit of Elijah, comes at the dark hour. The spirit of Elijah, if you, if you look at John the Baptist and you look at Elijah, they did not rise up in the power when everything was hunky-dory great. It was dark. It was very dark. So, hallelujah, we're there. Yep, yes, we may very well be on the cusp of Jesus Christ rising up, lifting up one crying in the wilderness so that he can get the world straightened up so he can come back. That's his pattern. You can say, well, I don't know. I'm just telling you, according to the pattern, that's what he does. And when you start looking at the darkness in Genesis 1-1, Genesis 1-1, the very beginning of the book, Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. God always starts in the dark. Do not let the, we preach the sermon, do not be afraid of the dark. When something goes on and you find yourself in the dark, hallelujah, that's where God starts working. What a, what a wonderful opportunity for God to move in our life. These people are looking for a home. It was dark. This looks horrible. If something don't happen, i got to go live in my, my mother's basement. That don't sound very good. When did God move for them? In the dark. When it was dark. In 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 4, 6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. John 1, 5, it says, And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In Matthew 4, 16, it says, The people which sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them would sit in the region and shadow of death, why it sprung up. In 1 Peter 2, 9, there were, when I started looking, there were so many scriptures, hard to pick one, you know what I'm saying? There were so many scriptures about God calling forth the light out of the darkness. Do not be afraid of the situation. That is exactly when God moves. That is exactly when God sent Elijah. That is exactly when God sent John the Baptist. It says, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, is one of our favorite scriptures. 
Isaiah 62. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee and the glory shall be seen upon thee. He said, when's, that going to happen? when's the glory of God going to rise up on us? In the dark. <clears throat> when things get dark. So you say, was it dark under Ahab? Was Ahab really all that bad a guy? Well, in 1 Kings 16, 33, it says, And Ahab made a grove. Now, any time that you read in the Old Testament and you see that a king is making a grove or a priest is making a grove or whatever, that grove ain't just, you know, when, when I remember when I first got saved, I'd read it and say, Well, he planted a little vineyard. That's neat. You know, no, it ain't. Because that wasn't what he was doing. A grove was not a little vineyard. A grove was a place to worship Baal. A grove was a place to worship Ashtoreth. A, a grove was a place to worship a false god. <clears throat> so when it says, when Ahab made a grove, it ain't talking about him being uh, in the, what is that, horticulture? It ain't talking about that. He's into false worship. He's worshiping false idols. He's worshiping false gods. And it says, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that was before him. Was Ahab a good guy? No. What do you think it was like in Israel at that time? It's dark. It was dark. He was a horrible, awful ruler. I'll just let that hang. I'll just let that float at that. When do you think God's going to do something? You think it's about time God do something? Ahab was the worst ruler ever. You think it's about time for God to do something? Yes. Yes. I do. Yes. I do. Was it dark? Now, see, we don't think about it being dark under John the Baptist. And again, Becky, here's so many scriptures, I couldn't pick them. Yeah. I, I said, well, I want to see how dark it was under John the Baptist, and I'll do it this way. And it's like, man, alive, look at all this. Look at all this horribleness. Under John the Baptist, Jesus Christ said, the men of Nineveh, you remember Nineveh? Remember what happened in Nineveh? God sent uh, Jonah to Nineveh because he was going to destroy Nineveh because Nineveh was so evil. He was going to destroy it. And Jesus said, the men of Nineveh, this horrible, awful place that I had to send uh, somebody to and preach to to save it, and it only spared them for 40 years, they eventually was destroyed anyway. <clears throat> there was a great revival that went on. That generation was fine. Forty years later, that you're done. But he said, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation. He's going, he said, the men of Nineveh is going to judge this generation, the generation that he was standing there talking to. How bad was they that the people of Nineveh is going to judge them? That's pretty bad. He said, and they're going to condemn it. He said, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater one than Jonah is here now. In Matthew 12, 42, that's the next verse, he says, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the, she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Uh, Matthew 12, 45, he said, then goeth he, and take it with he's not, Now, we've always read this as being uh, about demons, and it is about demons. Okay, he said, when, when you cast a demon out of a guy, that uh, the demon goes through dry places, trying to find a place to live, and he can't find nothing, so he goes back to his house. And when he gets to his house, he said, man, this thing's clean and put in order. Everything's great. I'm going to grab seven of my buddies, and we're going to move back in. <clears throat> okay, and Jesus said, the last state of that guy is going to be worse than the beginning. We said, okay, he's talking about demons. I never caught this before. Listen to what he says. He says, Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay, that's what we just talked about. All right, the next verse says, Even so shall it be also with this wicked generation. What was it like when Jesus was here? What kind of generation was it? Jesus said it's seven times worse than anything I've ever seen. He said, you guys are horrible. In Matthew 17, 17, it says, Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. All right, so um, it was a horrible, horrible time. Now, when we first meet Elijah, what is it that Elijah is doing? He is speaking against the king. 
He's speaking out against the king. The very first verse, he's talking to Ahab and he's passing judgment on Ahab and his kingdom. He said, it, the very first thing, when we're introduced to Elijah, he said, it ain't going to rain no more, king, until I say so. We need some Elijah's, man. We need some Elijah's raising up. He wasn't afraid of the king. He spoke against the king. So, was John the Baptist any different? Did John the, was it the same spirit? Same spirit. Did, did John the Baptist cower in the corner? Now, I cannot see anywhere that uh, Elijah spoke against the priesthood, but he spoke against the king. Him and Ahab had big time battles, man. Him and Ahab, well, actually, he did speak against the priest. He came against uh, the kings. He came against the priests. He said, well, what he spoke about the priest? He took him up on Mount Carmel. He gathered up all the priests and he said, either God is God or God ain't God. You need to figure out who you're going to worship and worship him. So he was not a, we are under the greatest authority ever. Billy Graham, years ago, they asked him if he would run for president. And you know what he said? He said, why would I step down from the highest office in the world to be president of the United States? Jesus said, I've given you all authority. I've given it to you. I'm giving you all authority. Why would I be afraid of man? Why would I be afraid of the president? Why would I be afraid of some name in a church somewhere because he's got a big following? If he's not lining up with the word of God, he's not lining up. That's right. yeah. I need to fear God more than man. I need to trust God more than man. I need to lift up God more than man. So Elijah came against the king. He came against the priest. What about John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist that way? Well, one of my favorite verses here. Now, what the, the main thing, the main uh, gist of the message for both these men was repent. That was the main thing they both were saying. That's what the whole showdown on that Carmel was about, repent. That's what he said. He said, if God is God, then worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. But quit sitting on the fifth post. Quit sitting between two minds. Either worship one or worship the other, but don't worship both of them. What's that say? Repent! Yeah. Repent! So that's what John the Baptist was preaching. That's what Elijah was doing. So John the Baptist, in Matthew 7, 3, 7, it says, but when he saw many of the fair many, what, two of them? No, man, there's a slew of them. There's a bunch of them. Elijah's all by himself. Uh, John the Baptist all by himself too talking about the same, same spirit Elijah, Elijah wasn't out there with a whole bunch of people Elijah was by himself you read the story of Elijah Elijah was alone he didn't, he didn't try to hook up with other people he didn't try to get the other prophets and hook up well I'll say what you say no man Elijah stood out he wasn't worried about what anybody else said so John the Baptist what he did John the Baptist was the voice of one crying in the wilderness I do not care what the, what the Pharisees are saying. I do not care what the Sadducees are saying. I care what the Word of God says. I care what the Spirit of God says. Man, we need some Elijahs to raise up. It says that when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. These are the priests. These are the high muckety muck guys in the church. It wasn't the church, but you know what I'm saying. And he said, generation of vipers. He said, you snakes. Who warned you to come, flee from the wrath to come? He said, judgment, judgment, judgment is coming. Yeah. Who warned you, you snakes, you people that pretend to be godly, you people that pretend to do all this stuff for God, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And he said, bring forth therefore fruits me for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. He said, y'all going to be cut down. Your day, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about shaking. We have been talking about a great shaking that is going on. And we know that it's going on. What's going to fall? Everything. God says everything in Abraham is going to fall. Every, I'm, going to, I'm going to shake the heavens, I'm going to shake the earth, I'm going to shake the seas, I'm going to shake everything. And he says, only what I allow to remain is going to remain. And I've told you, there's going to be churches that will not reopen. They will not. 
And I say hallelujah. If they're not going to repent, if they're not going to preach the word of God, let them close. Well, I'm getting something out of this. Is anybody else? Yes. Okay. I mean, if I'm, if I'm going to get some, I'll go preach out back. I don't, you know. So, so now John not only spoke out against the church, and you guys know I'm not meaning it, the church didn't exist, but the rulers, the religious rulers of the day, he spoke out against them. Why? Well, Jesus did the same thing. That's what got Jesus killed. The, the priest was the one that got Jesus killed. Uh, the king was the one that got John killed. Because what happened, John wound up in prison. Why did he wind up in prison? Because he said, everything you do is fine and dandy. Everything's great. Just do whatever you want. Everything's okay. God loves you. No. There was two brothers, Herod Antipas and Herod, I don't know his name. That's a long name, isn't it? It's German. Herod, I don't know his name. But these two guys were married. Both these guys were married. Now, Herod Antipas had never seen his wife, the other guy's wife. And when he, when he met with him, they had a big, uh, I don't know what it was, some kind of Christmas celebration, some kind of family reunion, whatever. Uh, one was ruling over Judea and one was ruling somewhere else. And when they got together, old uh, Herod Antipas looked at Herodias and he said, man, she's smoking hot bad. And he says, I, I, I want that. So he got a divorce from his wife and Herodias got a divorce from her husband. And those two got married. And you know who told him that it was not right to do that? John the Baptist. God was, God was governor over Judea. Why didn't John just say, <clears throat> you're government, whatever you do is fine. I'm sure that John was out there preaching one day, out there wearing camel hair and eating locusts. There was a guy who used to say, had uh, uh, grasshopper by his feet hanging out of his mouth, you know, whatever. Out there preaching, and Herod happened to walk by. Herod, I think the Bible tells us Herod went out to see him. I mean, the guy's got a name. Things are going on. Let's go see who this guy is. And so Herod was probably, think about that. If we're having a church service and some leader walks in and say, You're a thief! Is that, is that good? He's got all his people with him and everything. So that's what happened. I, I would bet that that's what happened. He probably didn't meet with him in private. He's probably there with a big crowd. Uh, baptizing people, Herod walks up and says, it ain't lawful for you to have your brother's wife. John winds up in prison. And because of Herod's great lustful uh, problem that he had, that's what got John killed. Because Herod actually uh, was afraid of John. John he, he reverenced him. He considered him to be a man of God. Hey, you ever have your conscience eaten up? I know that's right, but I don't want to change it. And then uh, Salome did that dance, and he said, I'll give you. He said, man, he said, that was so nice, I'll give you. Why? He had a lust problem. Obviously, if you divorce your wife and have your girlfriend uh, divorce her husband, you got a lust problem, man. you got problems. And he said, he said uh, man, you're, man, I'm just a hippie. You know what I'm saying? He said, you're so smoking hot that you tell me what you want. I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. I don't know how old she was. But she was so young that she went to her mother and asked her mother what she ought to ask for. The guy had problems. And John the Baptist called him out on it. So, um, there's that. Now, uh, another thing that we ought to look at. I think I'm, I think I'm doing it. They were persecuted. These people were persecuted. Uh, they, they told Elijah. They said, they said if you see uh, Jezebel... There's always, in both cases, there was a woman involved. There was a Jezebel with Ahab, two of the most wicked, horrible people that you're going to find in the Bible, is Jezebel and Ahab. And they were the ones that was in charge. And Ahab was actually out in front. He's the guy. And Jezebel was more wicked than Ahab. She was doing all the junk in the background. Uh, and uh, Herod had Herodias. And uh, they, those two was the ones that John the Baptist killed. So it seems like every time there's a horrible, awful uh, leader, there's some woman hanging around him. That's all I want to say. I'm telling you, man, it's time. I'm not talking to you. I don't, I'm not a horrible, awful leader, am I? Come on. I'm talking about somebody else. 
Anyway. So, um, so they, they talked about that. Okay. So his message was repent. Was it repent for all of both of them? And now another thing, these men were confrontational. And that's, that's one of the things that the church has lost. It's one of the things that's dropped off. And the world has told us to shut up. And we said, okay. And this, the one crowd in the wilderness ain't going to shut up. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm that, I don't know. I don't know what God's got for me. I don't know what God's got for any of us. You know, just, just do the next step. That's all you can do. You know, they would, they would put lanterns around their legs. You may not know that. So that when they was carrying stuff, they put these lanterns around their legs so that they could light it. Thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. That's what that means. Because in the dark, they would take one step at a time because that's all that was lit up. They couldn't see down the road. I can't see down the road. I just know the next step. But I guarantee you, God knows the way. And if you take the next step when he tells you to take the next step, you'll get where he wants you to go. Amen? <clears throat> so, so these men, they were confrontational men. They said, they, you know, uh, Jesus also was confrontational. A lot of people tell you that the church is not supposed to be confrontational. I got into it a few years ago. On a guy, with the guy on Facebook about it, for an old friend of mine, he said, well, you know, the, the church is supposed to be like this. And I said, you're not even a Christian. What do you know? I'm tired of the world telling me what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to uh, say and all this stuff. I want to do what God tells me to do. It says that those that are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Not, not those that are led by the headlines in the newspaper. Not those that are uh, led by public opinion. The ones that are led by the Spirit of God. Those are the sons of God. <clears throat> so, uh, you remember Ananias and Sapphira? Anybody, anytime anybody tells me, well, the church is supposed to be yah, yah, yah. Well, it, Remember Ananias and Sapphira? You guys remember them, don't you? All they did was lie. What they did, let's just say they sold something for $100. But let's say they sold something for $100 and they kept $50. And then when they gave it to Peter, they said, uh, this is what we sold it for, $50. Now, they could, why didn't they just say, hey, man, we sold it for $100 we kept $50? Would you be offended if somebody did that? Hey, I, I, uh, church, I sold my car for ten thousand dollars, and I'm going to give you five five thousand dollars. I'm going to keep it. Who cares? It's your money. Do what you want. But they lied to the Holy Spirit because they wanted to look good. Well, they gave it all, so they wanted to look. Good. And guess what happened? They fell down dead. And Ananias, this is New Testament church. This ain't Old Testament. This is under grace, man. This is the new covenant. And we say, oh, just let him do, oh, just love it, oh, it's okay. You know, you sin, you do whatever, you know. Um, I, that's how I feel inside. That's how, that's how I feel, okay, you do whatever you feel inside. Well, I'm going to tell you what, if I did a few years ago what I felt inside, I'd be in prison right now. The, the, you are fighting that temptation. You've got to come against that stuff. If somebody tells you, well, I'm, I'm gay or I'm this because of all, it doesn't matter. You think I ain't tempted? You think there ain't things that I want to do? Everybody in here, everybody in here right now, you could raise your hand and say, before I came to church today, I thought I wanted to go get drunk. Or I wanted to do this. Or I wanted to do that. I wanted to divorce my wife and have my friend divorce his wife. Who was it? We're talking about Harry. Ladies and gentlemen. We all suffer through temptation. We all deal with that. Okay? But these men were confrontational. And I was just fired out there. I remember Paul was preaching to the to the Jews, and the Jews wouldn't receive. Now imagine somebody in the church did this today. They, he was preaching to the Jews. The Jews would not accept him. He took his clothing and he said, "Your blood be on you, man. I'm going to go preach to the Gentiles. If you consider yourself to be unworthy of eternal life, I'm going to go preach to them." They kicked people out of churches. You can read in the Bible where people wouldn't get straightened up. Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, there was a guy, and he was he was uh, sleeping with his mother, his stepmother. And Paul said, put him out of the church. Can you imagine, Vicki, putting somebody out of the church today? Well, I can't believe they put him out. I can't believe they sent him. Well, Paul said, you're doing stuff that the world don't even do. And he said, put the guy out of the church. You can read it in 1 Corinthians. Go home today. If you don't believe me, go home today and read 1 Corinthians. You'll 
find it right in there. In 2 Corinthians, the guy had repented, and Paul said, let him back in the church. He said, the guy repented, let him back in. Man, there you go. Uh, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he gave him a, a, a history lesson about Jesus Christ. And then he said, but you guys, you, you murdered him. You killed him. Now, another thing about these men, these men heard from God. And, and one of the things, you know, as, as I look over, I, you know, I don't know how many years i got left, but one of the things, if you've been with me very long, one of the things that I strive to do is for you to have a better relationship with God because of the ministry that God has placed upon me. I want you to know him better than you would have, you would have known him had you not known me. I want you to have a relationship with God. Why? Because that's God's cry. That is God's desire. He did not save you so that you could talk to God through me. He saved you because he wants to have a relationship with you. You are his child. You are his son. He wants to fellowship with you. And these men, they heard from God. In 2 Kings 1-3, this is the second time that we, when we get to, now Elijah's talking about in 1 Kings, the first time he's mentioned in 2 Kings, it says, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, who spoke, who spoke to him? Angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord spoke to him. And said, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ephraim? So he told him, God, the angel of the Lord spoke to Elijah and said, Go and speak. Again, Elijah's a voice crying in the wilderness. God uses him as a voice. He said, Go and speak to these men. And Elijah did it. He didn't, he didn't take a poll. He didn't uh, feel it out and say, are these guys going to be happy when I go up there and tell them this? No. He said, God told me to do this. I'm going to go do it. What about John the Baptist? I, I love this. It says, and John bore record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and in a boat on him. We know he did that. Why was John out there baptizing? Who told John to go out and start baptizing people and telling them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand? Who did that? Well, John told you. He said, and I knew him not. He said, I did not know who the Messiah was going to be. I did not know him, who, who he was. And he said, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remain on him, the same as he that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. What did John say? Someone told him. Who was it? Some old man? Or, or, no, God told him. I don't know how God told him. I don't, know, I don't know if he had a dream. I don't know if he had a vision. I don't know if, uh, if the angel of the Lord appeared to I don't know. But God told John what to do, and John went and did it. And I'm going to tell you something about God. God is going to give everybody, if, when the spirit of Elijah arrives, well, not even, just any time. God is going to give you an opportunity to be obedient to him. God is not going to hold out. And like I said, it may be some little thing. God may tell you to do something. Again, we're taking steps. When God tells you to do something, it may seem like some little nothing. Just be obedient. Just do it. I, I want my Father in heaven to, to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want my God in heaven to say, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen? Amen. So now both of these men had a voice. Uh, so what's that mean? A message is going to, whenever this takes place, there's going to be a message. There's going to be a message that is going to rise up, and that message somehow will shape a form, and that message is going to be repent. Repent is going to be a part of that message. Elijah done miracles. Elijah did all kinds of miracles. Uh, here's seven of them right here. Uh, he, he was fed. Now see, when you start looking something, I, I had to look it up. I, I thought of it this morning. I said, I'll go over Elijah's miracles. And uh, he was fed by ravens. I don't know how Elijah did that. Elijah didn't do that. God did that. But we see miracles in his life. He was fed by ravens. He multiplied the widow's food. He raised the boy from the dead. He called fire down from heaven. He called fire down on soldiers. There was these soldiers one time that came looking for him. You might remember uh, the disciples, they was going along, and, and the disciples asked Jesus, saying, you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume these guys because they, they wouldn't receive them? The reason they wouldn't receive them was because Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He said he had his foot 
His face set like flint towards Jerusalem. And so they, the people wouldn't receive him because Jesus wasn't going there no way. And the disciples got upset because they wouldn't worship Jesus. And they said, you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did? And Jesus said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. Remember that? He said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. But see, Elijah one time was sitting there and they came after him. They came looking for him. And when they showed up, they said, oh, great man. And I guess they was being uh, sarcastic. And they said, oh, great man of God, uh, the king, what you see? He said, if I'm really a man of God, let fire come down and consume all of them. And guess what happened? Boom, the fire came down and consumed all of them. So now they got all these charred, and Elijah's just sitting there. You got all these charred bodies laying around. So then uh, the next group came up, and he said, oh, great man of God, uh, the king wants to see. And he said, if I'm a great man of God, let fire come down and consume me. Now they got twice as many dead bodies laying around, all charred and burned up. And the third guy that came up with his troop, he said, man, I know you are a man of God. Please don't burn me up. You know, let's go do this. So he did. Um, he parted the Jordan, and he also got caught up into heaven. Well, it says it's 1046 on my watch, so we got all kinds of time. <laughs> now, I, 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 I want, I've got a little side note here, and uh, I, when I found out, I thought it was awesome. And so I wanted to, I wanted to share it if we had time. I'm almost done. Uh, in Exodus 3318, pardon? So already just had 30. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. I didn't set my clock up. They like saving time. Uh, so, that was, that was a joke. So, anyway. God, give me a brain, please. In, uh, in Exodus 30, this is awesome. This is awesome. Okay? Uh, this, this, like I said, this is a little side track. But I, I think that you'll enjoy the side track. When I heard it, I was like, wow, that's awesome. In Exodus 33 18, Moses, Moses is out on Mount Sinai. Okay? Moses is out on Mount Sinai, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim, look at this, he said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, the Lord said, there is a place by me. Where's Jesus? Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. He's right on the right hand of God the Father making intercession for me. God told Moses, he said, I got a place by me. He said, I got a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, that I will show thee in the cliff, I will put thee in the cliff of the rock. And will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away thy hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now again, Moses is on Mount Sinai, and God tells him, He said, I'm going to let you see my glory. And he said, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, I'm going to cover you with my hand, I'm going to pass by. So then in Exodus 34, 5, it says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses and proclaimed the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Jesus. Jesus is the name of the Lord Jesus. He said, uh, proclaim the name of the Lord, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He talked about grace. He talked about truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he was talking about Jesus Christ. He had Moses in the cleft of the rock. He had him covered. He walked by. He told Moses about Jesus Christ. The glory of God was all over Moses. And there's that. And then he says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, upon the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Okay? That's a great story. I mean, that happened. I don't mean it, but, but that's awesome. Moses was there on Mount Sinai, and God hit him in the cleft of the rock, and Moses saw the glory of the Lord. Oh, this is so good. This is good. 
So Moses saw the glory of the Lord. Okay, now you might remember a time that Elijah uh, was afraid, and Elijah went running into the wilderness to hide in the wilderness. Okay, now it says in 1 Kings 19, 8, it says, And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. He went to Mount Horeb. You know what another name for Mount Horeb is? Mount Sinai. That's Mount Sinai. So uh, Moses was on Mount Sinai. Elijah goes and runs to Mount Sinai. He meets God on Mount Sinai. And we know he did that. So Elijah and Moses were both on Mount Sinai and met God on Mount Sinai. Now when Moses came down off the hill, right after this, his face was all lit up. He actually put a veil over his face because the glory was fading away. This is good stuff. The glory was fading away, and he did not want people to see the glory fading away. He said, what's this got to do with anything? Anything at all. I just think it's awesome. Um, come forward. Does God live in time? God doesn't live in time. God lives outside of time. You ever heard of the Mount of Transfiguration? The Mount of Transfiguration, right before Jesus went to Jerusalem to be crucified, he went up on a mountain. And uh, he took his disciples up there, three of his disciples up there, and uh, he was transfigured before him. The glory of the Lord absolutely filled him. The, 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 the disciples tell us, the, the apostles, the writers of the Gospels tell us, that his clothing was whiter than any uh, any launderer could ever get him. He was just full of the glory of God. Do you know who else was there? Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses were there. Does God live in time? God lives outside of time. So what happened to, him, to Moses when God walked by him, when God started proclaiming Jesus Christ and was proclaiming the goodness, he was uh, translated in time. He was translated into the future, and he stood on that mountain with Jesus Christ and saw the future and saw the Messiah. Same thing happened to Elijah. So that's pretty cool. Because I've always interpreted that event a lot of different ways. But, you know, we got the spirit of truth. And when I heard that, I was like, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. And, uh, you know, when Elijah was up there on Mount Hor, God, uh, earthquake, and all that stuff, and then it's still small voice. And he said, you know, where did you find him? He said, I found him in a still small voice. So uh, I thought that was good. Now, Elijah, I'm about done here. Elijah and John the Baptist were both outcasts. Like I said, you don't see a whole lot of people hanging out with Elijah. You don't see people hanging out with John the Baptist. Elijah had no future, meaning he wasn't a priest or anything like that. John the Baptist, his dad was a priest. Uh, uh, I think uh, he was high priest. So what, did John the Baptist have a future? Yeah, man. John the Baptist could have been a priest. So the spirit of Elijah that rises up, like I said, it's going to be a no name. It's going to be somebody you never heard tell of. Uh, but chances are that if they had hooked up with the established church, they could have been a big deal. They could have been a big name. I'm not going to throw out any names. I'll just tell you that uh, a lot of the names I'm disgusted with. I'll just tell you. You know, uh, I talked to Vicki about it the other night. So, you know, some of the things that we learn. Uh, you, know, you got people making millions of dollars writing books about it, and it's false doctrine. And do they know it? I don't know. But anyways. Um, now another thing about these guys, they did not look right. They did not have on uh, fancy suits. And, and uh, they did not, probably didn't talk right, probably didn't anything else. Um, in, in 2 Kings 1, 7, and 8, there was a guy that came to the king, and he said, uh, 
he said, they met some prophet on the road, and the prophet had said something to him. And it says, and the king said unto him, what manner of man was he which came up to meet thee and told you these words? He said, who told you? Now, what did the priest look like? The priest looked good, man. <laughs> you know, they got, they got everything right. They got the big, uh, Jesus even told us they had the big phylacteries on their, on their borders, you know, to make them look like a big deal, you know. So here comes this prophet talking to this guy. And they answered him and said, he was a hairy man. He was a hairy man. He wasn't, he wasn't worth looking at, man. He's a hairy, looked like a bear coming in. He was a big hairy man, and he had, was girt with a girdle of leather uh, about his loins. I mean, who's this guy? He looks horrible. And you know what the king said? He said, that's Elijah the Tishbite. Immediately. He knew who he was talking about. Well, that's Elijah the Tishbite. He didn't look like everybody else. He didn't look all slick and polished. He wasn't worried about presenting himself all slick and polished. He said, God, you tell me. Man, one of the worst looking guys in the Bible was uh, Ezekiel. Man, a lot of you start reading Ezekiel. Guy laying on his right side, cooking his food on, on poop. There's my guy. He's all slick back and pretty looking. No, man, he ain't. When, when did we allow the world into the church in such a way that we think if somebody ain't wearing a suit, you ain't got nothing to say? And we all know John, clothed in camel hair, running around, like I said, the guy had a lot. Now, locusts might have been actually a, a uh, root. It may not have been the hoppers, but it could have been. I don't know. Um... Now, neither one of these guys appear to have finished their ministry. Uh, Elijah, God told Elijah, he said, anoint Elisha in your stead. And so he did that. And I was, I was reading it last night. Some people say that Elijah served Elijah for 10 years. I don't know. I know that Elijah never died. So he, he got out of here without dying. So his ministry was cut short. Wouldn't you say that? You know, most everybody else winds up dying. That's when their ministry ends, when, when their feet's pointing straight up in the air or whatever. But Elijah didn't die, so his ministry got cut short. Did John's ministry get cut short? Yeah. So what's that mean? That means that when this happens, it's a short thing. This, this, this message of repentance, whenever it rises up, whenever the voice of Elijah rises up, it's going to be short-lived. Now, it might be five years, might be three, I don't know. I don't know how long it'll last, but it will be short-lived. But the good thing is that it ushers in something greater. It always ushers in something greater. When Elijah uh, passed over his ministry, when Elijah passed his ministry on to Elijah, Elijah did seven miracles that's recorded in the Word of God. Elijah, Elisha did 15. John the Baptist, can you tell me a miracle that John the Baptist did? John the Baptist didn't do any. Now, he did but not like we think. He turned half of Israel's hearts to God. So his miracle was repentance. His miracle was a message of repentance that people received and responded to. He also uh, found the Messiah. That Jesus Christ wouldn't have been revealed had it not been for John the Baptist. When John the Baptist, and that's what it was all about. That's why he was out doing what he was doing so that people could see Jesus. Amen. And that's exactly what happened when he baptized Jesus. The Spirit of God ascended to on him like a dove. And that's how he knew. And from then on, uh, John would, anytime he saw Jesus, he'd say, Behold the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin. He said, That's the guy. And John also said, I've got to decrease so that he can increase. And so whenever this, whenever this happens, whenever this, like I said, it might be, we might get home today and say, It's happening right now in front of me. I don't know. Like I said, I may not live to see. I don't know. I believe that it's going to usher in the return of Jesus Christ. And I believe that you're going to see a great move of God. After the call of repentance, you're going to see a great move of God. Once people get cleaned up and the, move, the, the, the call of repentance is going to help people get cleaned up. There's going to be power there for people to live better. To realize, you know, what I'm doing is wrong. Right now, nobody's telling me. Right now, the church ain't telling me. 
You say, well, how do we tell them? Listen to the Spirit of God. We just talked about that. If the Spirit of God judges you, to, and however it is. I mean, you know, it may not be standing there in the lunchroom with all your buddies running and looking at somebody and saying, you're in sin. It probably ain't going to be that way. But God will tell you how to do it. God will tell you when to do it. Man, you guys have been quiet. I hope you're getting something out of it. But I, I believe that that's I believe that that's coming. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody got anything to add? No. Uh, you know we need to get in the habit of this. We never do it because um, everybody here is saved. But uh, we need to get in the habit of of giving people an opportunity. And uh, you know one one of the things that I have noticed. Uh, you guys know I'm doing some teaching online. I always want to do an altar call on it. And uh, the simplicity of the gospel, God is really driving it home to me. You know, in Romans uh, uh, 10, 9, and 10, 10, it says if you believe in your heart that uh, Jesus is Lord and, and you confess him as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. And, you know, you start thinking. See, we've been taught, well, you know, you got to have somebody playing the piano just as I am or a rock of ages, you know, whatever. You know, how did they do it on the day of Pentecost? There was 3,000 people saved on the day of Pentecost. You think they yanked out an organ and started banging on it? You know? No. You're saved when you believe that Jesus Christ is alive. The Bible plainly tells us that if you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and you confess that, you're saved. And so uh, right now, I mean, it's that simple. That's, that's how you see the kingdom. That's how you get started in the kingdom. Now, you'll change. You sin, you will. God will deal with you about your sins and everything else. But you've got to have that Holy Spirit living in you to make those changes. You cannot change yourself on your own strength. You've got to. Because, see, the problem ain't out here. The problem's in here. You know, you got a problem with sin because it's in here, not out here. And so you got to start on the inside. Jesus talked about it. He said, you make the outside of the temple. We ain't worried about making the outside pretty. Let's get the inside cleaned up. And when we get the inside cleaned up, the outside will be all pretty. That's what Jesus said. And so we got to start on the inside. And so if you believe that Jesus Christ is alive and well and died for you, you confess him as Lord, and you're on your way. That's the beginning. And so if anybody in here, and that's what they did on the day of Pentecost. Peter preached that sermon, and then people said, I believe. All right, man, 3,000 of you. Praise God. So if you've never made a public confession of faith, I hope, I hope enough. If you want to say Jesus is your Lord, you're welcome to say it right now. Jesus is my Lord. Praise God. He rose from the dead. He's living on the right side of God the Father for me. Amen. Amen. So, amen. So. Uh, with that, uh, does anyone need hands laid on them? We'll turn it over to Kathy for prayer request. But does anybody need hands laid on them for, for prayer? They do, they do. You just sit right here. Look at him, he's running. <laughs> <laughs> just stand up here, Zach.
Is that better? That sounds a little better, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I uh, just told you that was Keith, and uh, he had been diagnosed with cancer, and uh, we he took his chemo and stuff, but we was praying for him and believing, and, and he's been uh, he's been totally healed. And uh, he's got some foot problems, and uh, we're praying about that as well. And, uh, man, uh, if, you'd, if you'd seen how he was uh, when we found out what was going on with him and started praying— I mean, God has really, uh, God has really blessed him, and uh, hungry for God, hungry for God. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, let's see, we've already did the altar call. Let's uh, let's do the uh, the blessing. I appreciate you again for uh, stopping in. Um, just had a just had a really really rough week. I told uh, told somebody, I said, you know, I feel like I've been pruned so much this week that all I got left is bark. And uh, that's a double, that's a joke, because, uh, you know, when you get the limbs pruned off, all you got left is the bark. Ah! The bark. So, anyway. Um, so, having had a rough week, and a lot of other people I know has had a rough week, uh, I just wanted to get, get something out there to let the devil know that uh, we're still believing the Lord. Amen. So, stretch forth your hand. For the blessing, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I bless thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Remember that uh, God is crazy about you. And if you want, you can drop us a line at do you know Jesus is for you at gmail.com. Thank you again for stopping in. May you have a uh, wonderful day. Uh, wonderful blessing in the Lord until we, we see each other again. Thank you.